Okay. Now is the time. Yes. Tonight is the night. It is the first edition of the Creepy Little Book Club. I regret this already. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. We're late by weeks. We've gone from saying we're going to do seven chapters down to just doing one. But I think that's okay. We'll make more shows out of it, right? I mean, that's what will happen at the end of the day. So, uh, so there we go. Anyway, folks, this is the creepy little book. I'm your host, Pete. Uh, generally, we do uh, all kinds of various topics on this channel. But tonight is something new for us tonight and something early. Indeed, it is a creepy little book club. Something we've been planning for a while and is uh, built up around this book that I'm holding right here in my hand. Uh, it is called The Nine Unknown by Talbot Mundy. So we're going to talk a little bit about Talbot Mundy. We're going to talk a little bit about who he was. We're going to give you an overview of the book. And we're going to delve into the first chapter because that's really what we have been talking about uh, getting into tonight. So again, thank you all for being here. Appreciate you all tuning in. Much appreciation for you being here tonight. Thank you very much. And for those of you who have, have read the book, uh, <clears throat> thank you for those of you who picked it up. Practically a matinee, says Michelle Canham for it. That's right. That's right. And I'll probably be back late in the middle of the night to do this again. As long as I can keep coming up with topics, I'll come back. So, yeah. Oh, Stephen Albert, good evening. What type of debauchery are you up to now? Well, Stephen, we're going to get into a book called The Nine Unknown by Talbot Mundy. We're going to talk about the first chapter of this book in our little book club here tonight. Talking about this very esoteric work called The Nine Unknown. And I think that in our effort to read the book, we bought up most of the copies. Um, I actually received a message from a member of the community who was informed that their book needed to be printed before it could be shipped to them because they were all done out of that print run. So I want to, I hope to attribute that to us. I think, you know, as a, as a small group, we've got a little bit of power to, uh, you know, make a noticeable impact on weird books if we all buy them at the same time. So that's no small feat, no small feat. Anyway, thanks for being here tonight for the first inaugural edition of the creepy little book club and our first book, the nine unknown by Talbot Mundy. Now this book was written in 1923. Well, well it was serialized in adventure magazine in 1923. Talbot Mundy was a writer of adventure fiction based for most of his life in the United States. He wrote under the pseudonym of Walter gate, best known as the author of King of the Kyber rifles and the Jim Grimm series. Much of his work was published in pulp magazines. He was born to a conservative middle-class family in Hammersmith, London, educated at Rugby College. He left with no qualifications and moved to British India, where he worked in administration and then journalism. He then relocated to East Africa, where he worked as an ivory poacher, and then as the town clerk of Kis Umunu. In 1909, he moved to New York City in the U.S., where he found himself living in poverty. A friend encouraged him to start writing about his life experiences, and he sold his first short story to Frank Muncy's magazine, The Scrapbook, in 1911. He soon began selling short stories and nonfiction articles to a variety of pulp magazines, uh, such as Argosy, Cavalier, and Adventure. In 1914, Mundy published his first novel, Rung Ho, soon followed by The Winds of the World and King of the Khyber Rifles, all of which were set in British India and drew upon his own experiences. Critically acclaimed, they were published in both the U.S. and U.K. In 1918, he became a U.S. citizen, and he joined the Christian Science New Religious Movement, with, and then moved to Jerusalem to establish the city's first English-language newspaper. Returning to the U.S. in 1920, he began writing uh, the Jim Grimm series and saw the first film adaptations of his stories. Spending time in the theosophical communities of La Lambda Land in San Diego, California, he became a friend of Catherine Tingley and embraced theosophy. Many of his novels produced in the coming years, most notably Ohm, The Secret of Abhor Valley, and The Devil's Guard, reflect his theosophical beliefs. He also involved himself in various failed business ventures, including an oil drilling operation in Tijuana, Mexico, 
During the Great Depression, he supplemented his career writing novels and short stories by authoring scripts for radio series Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. In later life, he suffered from diabetes and eventually uh, succumbing to complications arising from that disease. Uh, his career and work was often compared to that of more commercially successful contemporaries, Rudyard Kipling and H. Ryder Haggard. Although, unlike their work, he adopted an anti-colonialist stance and expressed a positive interest in Asian religion and philosophy. His work has been cited in the influence of a variety of later science fiction and fantasy writers and has been the subject of two biographies. So that's just a little bit about Talbot Mundy, the man who wrote The Nine Unknown Men. What's The Nine Unknown Men all about? Like I said, it was originally serialized in Adventure Magazine, and it concerns nine unknown men, a secret society founded by the Maurian Emperor Akosha around two uh, uh, Ash, Ashoka. I'm sorry, Ashoka. Around 270 BC, to preserve and develop knowledge that would be dangerous to humanity if it fell into the wrong hands. The nine unknown men were entrusted with guarding nine books of secret knowledge. In the novel, the nine men uh, are the embodiment of good and face up against nine Kali worshippers who sow confusion and masquerade as the true sages. The story surrounds a priest named Father Cyprian who is in possession of books but wants to destroy them out of Christian piety. There are a number of other characters who are interested in learning the contents of the books or who have other agendas altogether their own. This was influential, though. Because the concept of the Nine Own Men was popularized by Louis Powell's and Jacques Berger in their 1960 book, The Morning of the Magicians. They claimed that the Nine Unknown were real and had been founded by the Indian Emperor Ashoka. They also claimed that Pope Sylvester II, who I've done a video about on this channel myself and I've spoken of at length in regard to the brazen head that he created and his magical abilities, Pope Sylvester II had met with them and that 19th century French colonial administrator and writer Louis Jalliot insisted on their existence. The Nine Unknown were also the final dictatees, dedicate, I'm sorry, dedicatees mentioned in the dedication of the first edition of LaVey's Satanic Bible in 1969. So uh, they are the Nine Unknown Men, part of a secret group of men who protect the nine books nine books and the nine books uh, contain this secret wisdom each book dedicated to a different di dis discipline uh, of wisdom if you will so let's talk about the book itself so we're just addressing chapter one today we're you know I don't know how long we're going to be on here or how long it's going to take to go through but chapter one uh, it really sets up, I, I think it's a little clunky, honestly, um, in my personal opinion. Uh, I think it's a little clunky. Uh, the chapter one is a, it's a bit packed with characters. You know, right off the bat, you're, you're introduced to like 13 guys <laughs> all at once. Um, Stephen Albert says, I've heard Masonic friends reference these nine. Well, again, like we said, because of the morning of the magicians, people believe the nine unknown are a real thing, even though they are based in this fictional work, you know, and again, because of people like David Icke, people believe the reptile men exist, even though they were the creation of Robert E. Howard in his uh, fictional writings back uh, when he was alive, creating characters like Conan the Barbarian and Cull the Conqueror. Galinus, I couldn't even get through chapter one. You know what? It's a tough read. It's a tough read. Let's let's just get that out of the way right now. I wish I had picked a better book for us to start with, honestly. Let's let's be God's honest. I like the premise of the book. I like the idea of the book, but I don't like the execution at all. Like I, I feel like uh, with this idea, uh, a better writer could do so much more. It just feels that there's so much jammed in that first chapter. So many characters that you're introduced to right off the bat. Um, that it, it's it's tough. It is tough. No, you make a good point. You make a good point. Because I've read it. I've read the first chapter three times. I read the first chapter three times. It's written in. 
in, in such a manner that I, I have trouble comprehending what's going on because you've got a, a lot of characters introduced all at once. And I think that's to its detriment. I think that's to its detriment. Um, <laughs> Rex Tillis. <laughs> I demand book report by morning. <laughs> Oh, Macca Raid, how you doing, Macca? Good to see you tonight. Thanks for tuning in. We're doing uh, the book club, book club tonight. So we're talking about Chapter 1 of The Nine Unknown. So far, Glynis is a, uh, and I have agreed that this is a tough read. Uh, I believe Courtney popped in earlier and mentioned it was a tough read, too, uh, at the top of the chat. Um, I think that's something we can all agree on. It is a tough read. Uh, Man Ray of Hope says that uh, Baloney Pete, Snake Men have been in myths for millennia. Uh, not necessarily, uh, Man Ray of Hope. Look into it. You will find no Snake Men in mythology. You will find the Feathered Serpent, Quetzalcoatl. But you don't find, I mean, besides dragons, maybe the Dragon King from Asia, uh, from Chinese mythology. Um, but, you know, you just, Lizard Men are not replete throughout history. There are a couple uh, Sumerian sculptures that I think could be misinterpreted as lizard people or interpreted as lizard influenced people. But it all Serpent Man is all Robert E. Howard. That's just that's just I've, I've done the digging. It's all Robert E. Howard. If you want the first mention of Serpent Man in literature ever, it's Robert E. Howard. Deranged Lunatic for ninety nine cents. Uh, Deranged Lunatic's got a little poop emoji there. Well, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mary, who mentioned the Naga? Yeah, the Naga. Okay, the Serpent People of India. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Medusa was a Gorgon, but we're not we're talking about reptilians. We're talking about straight up reptilians. Say, serpent Man. The Serpent Man of Robert E. Howard's creation. But we're not here talking about Serpent Men tonight, guys. So let's not get too off track. We can talk about Serpent Men any other time of night. I mean, I don't have a topic picked out for 11 o'clock yet. So if you want, we can talk about Serpent Men. Um, we'll, we'll figure out something for later on tonight. Um, <clears throat> but what we're talking about tonight is this book that we started reading. It's called The Nine Unknown Men. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say most of you probably haven't read it, which is fine. I'll, I'll give you a kind of a rundown of what happens in Chapter 1 because that's all we're talking about tonight. All we're talking about is chapter one of this book that's tough to read, but has a great premise. And the premise of the story essentially is that we are introduced to the 13 characters that flesh out this group of adventurers who are uh, in the service of someone named Father Cyprian. And Father Cyprian is, to my understanding, an 80-year-old priest who has been collecting rare esoteric books. So he's collecting all these occult books, all these books on necromancy, all these books on the, the black magics and the dark arts. And he's made his career of doing that. And the purpose of him collecting these books is because he wants to burn them all at once. He wants to burn them all. And then hopefully then go to his maker right after, but he believes that's his purpose in life to eradicate from the face of the earth, this kind of information so that it can never be rediscovered again. So it is definitely uh, an interesting character in that regard. Uh, you know, uh, we, when we're talking about this kind of uh, this story, it isn't setting up for an adventure tale. It is setting up for an adventure tale. It does talk about the eclectic mix of characters that come together for the purpose of retrieving these books and of their different um, agendas, if you will. It seems that some of them, uh, you know, it, it mentions this first guy and I took, uh, I've got the wrong notebook in front of me. Uh, so if you'll just excuse me a moment, let me go grab the right notebook. Cause I did take some notes here. Just a moment. I got the wrong book. What can I tell you? I grabbed the wrong one. It's just right here across the room. So don't worry. It's not like I got to go digging around all through creation to find it. But I did take notes to some of these characters when I first started getting into the book. Uh, a, a while back because I thought they were interesting because you have uh, essentially there is a narrator uh, and it's not clear to me who the narrator is yet I'm not clear on who the narrator is but the narrator is a member of the party so you've got a guy named Chundler Ghosts I believe that's how you pronounce his name 
And he's the one whose motives aren't clear. He's somebody who every time you ask him, he's got a different answer for why he's on this, you know, adventure with the rest of these guys. Um, there's another guy named Jeremy Ross. Uh, he's an, an interesting character to uh, mention. In, in uh, he's one that stands out to me uh, when I recall reading it. Like some of them stand out, and some of them don't. Um, there are uh, there is a, a a Muslim guy and a Sikh guy, and they're friends, but they're constantly kind of going at it with each other over religion. Uh, and all this takes place in India. Like there, it, it seems to me that for the most part of this book. It takes place in a shop front, in a closed shop front off a side street somewhere in India. I forget exactly if they mentioned where they're at. <clears throat> but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, PG. Yes, terrible name. It is a terrible name. It's like, like where did where did you come up with a name like Chundler Ghost? Like it's C H U L L U N D E R Chun Chun Chalander. I don't even know. Like, is that a name from the nineteen twenties? I mean, come on, Chalander makes no sense. Uh, and, and there are other characters, like I said, this is, this is the first grouping of these characters this is the first time you see them coming together and they're kind of mentioned and named and, and it kind of sets up an idea of what their motives are, but it still really isn't clear. Um, some of them are interested in obtaining the books because they want the information in them and they don't care about the priest. Uh, and this is made clear. Uh, I, I started the second chapter, uh, cause I was going to address both tonight, but I didn't get through the second chapter. Like I said, I read the first chapter three times and I had a lot of trouble comprehending what was going on with it. I don't think it's exceptionally well-written. Um, so as far as that regard, I, I apologize because I thought this was going to be a better book than it was. Um, or maybe it just starts out rocky and it gets better. I hope that it does. I hope there's more intrigue and mystery and espionage here. Once we encounter these, you know, uh, different characters. <laughs> the Lanky Wanderer, how you doing tonight? Good to see you. Uh, says, it sounds like what a non-English speaker thinks sounds like an English name. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it sounds really made, it just sounds so made up, like uh, really out of the ordinary name uh, to, to consider uh, here. Oh, what's up, Sonny Cat? How you doing here? How you doing? Good to see you. We were talking about the Nine Unknown tonight. Now, uh, for me, the idea of the nine unknown is uh, a fun one, but I've always come from the perspective that this was a real group of secret men who possessed a secret nine books of wisdom and knowledge that were entrusted to their care because they don't want them to fall into the wrong hands. You know what I mean? Uh, I liked the idea of that. And I, and I realized that that doesn't come from any truth that comes from the morning of the magicians and the claims made in that 1960 book rather than whatever is written in this 1923 book. This 1923 book is just about the story that it's about. You know, it is it is about these guys in search of these nine books and how some of them are in it for the gold. I mean, specifically, it's mentioned uh, towards the end of the chapter here when he talks about all the missing gold in the world. You know, like how there's so much gold in the world throughout history that is just gone and who is in control of this gold and where did it go? And some believe it is in the hands of these nine unknown men. And, and it also talks to the different um, backgrounds too. Um, you know, and he mentions the gold uh, 40 million ounces. He exclaimed, Do you know how with only 1 million ounces a year, say for 6,000 years would mean how many trains of boxcars it would take to move it. It would need a fleet of ocean liners. Talk of secrecy is a joke. The nine unknown who kept said secret for 6,000 years, chill under ghosts retorted. And who is the money by right? Ask Grim. that being the kind of poor you could count on for the fighters, the finder, shouted Ali of Sukhandundaram, and Narayan Singh agreed, nodding, saying nothing, permitting his brown eyes to glow. And at that, Chalander Ghost looked owlish, knowing that the soldier wins but never keeps, 
sacrifices, serves, eats, promises, and dies in vain. He did not tell all that he knew, being a rather wise civilian. He sighed, Chundler Ghost did. You know, and, and this is an interesting character. I kind of want to see where his character goes because you don't know his motives, and they make that very clear off the start. I make that very clear off the start that his motives. <laughs> what, do you, what do we got here? Instead of reading this book, why don't you just read it for us and talk about the secret society of whatever Ashokan something. Uh, <laughs> talk, well, we are talking about the secret society at, at the same time. And I'm kind of going to blur the line between the first chapter of the book and, and what's going on here. Because like I said, I'm not going to sit around uh, here and, and beat you over the, the head with this for like an hour. I'm, you know, I just wanted to kind of get in, talk about the book for a little bit, set up what was going on in chapter one, and then we can come back and revisit this again when we talk about chapter two, which I guess we'll do next week if there's any interest in that. Like, Because uh, I mean, I know that a lot of people picked up the book in the last couple weeks. I don't know how many people who have read the book are, are actually here tonight and enjoying the topic uh, or have enjoyed the book. Uh, I think that uh, personally, like uh, we've discussed here, it is kind of a hard read. Rex Tullis asks, do you think the books are physically bound books or a euphemism for a different repository of knowledge? Oh, the nine books of the unknown men. No, I believe they're actual 6,000 year old books that are bound and held and, probably kept somewhere safe you know i'd like to believe that i'd like to believe that there are nine books dedicated to nine different disciplines full of uh, ancient wisdom and information maybe saved from the library of alexandria maybe they're the last nine books to be run out of the library of alexandria maybe they're so secret they were never in the library of alexandria to begin with maybe they've always been uh, kept in Asia. And that's why they survived. You know, uh, and maybe there was a secret society defended, I mean, dedicated to defending them. The historical book of St. Cyprian would be an interesting topic for later, says Com 433. Uh, let me go ahead and let me see here. The Book of St. Cyprian, The Sorcerer's Treasure, The Great Book of St. Cyprian. Pseudopigraphal attributed to the 3rd century St. Cyprian of Antioch. Not to be confused with St. Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage. Uh, the Book of St. Cyprian, The Sorcerer's Treasure. Let me jot this down right away. The Book of, what is that? Now, I, I, am, I am overwriting something here. I need a clean sheet of paper here. Let me turn the page to a clean sheet of paper. Okay. The book of St. Cyprian. Book of St. Cyprian. Grimoires from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, all pseudopigraphically attributed to the 3rd century St. Cyprian of Antioch. A pagan sorcerer who converted to Christianity. <clears throat> the Iberian Cyprian is not a single text, but multiple texts in Spanish and Portuguese, mostly from the 19th century. There was, however, a now lost modern, pre-modern Cyprianic literature with no apparent connection to any extant work beyond being inspired by the Cyprianic legend. So interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. St. Cyprian of Antioch. Known as the magician. Greece, Egypt, India. A magician in Antioch and dealt in sorcery. Justina of Antioch is a Christian saint known for converting Cyprian, a pagan medicine magician of Antioch. Justina was said to have been a young woman who took private vows of chastity and was killed during the persecutions of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. She is said to have been martyred in the year 304. It would be suitor sought a magic spell from Cyprian to induce Justina to marry him. The charms had no effect on Justina, who spent her time in prayer and fasting. Brought to despair, Cyprian made the sign of the cross himself, and this way was freed from the toils of Satan. 
he was received into the church and was made preeminent by miraculous gifts and became in succession deacon, priest, and finally bishop, while Justina became abbess of a convent. So that's a very interesting story there. The book of St. Cyprian. Definitely something to jot down and check into later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Com433. <clears throat> Dash Fat Bastard for $2 says, It's a cookbook! A cookbook! <laughs> Thank you, Dash. Much appreciated. Very much so. Thank you very much. Um... Justin Christopher's here. Justin says hello. Hello, Justin Christopher. How are you? We are uh, talking about the first chapter of The Nine Unknown Men tonight, a chapter that really sets up the book in a way that comes very rushed, in my opinion, and clunky. I think there's too many characters introduced all at once. They try to delve into their specific <laughs> motives all in a very rushed kind of manner all through the first chapter. Uh, and I would have liked to see a little more character development i think a little slower i'd rather get to know these guys and then know their motives rather than have have them kind of narrate it to me uh right off the bat but that was just my opinion on it uh so far you know we'll see how it goes uh as we continue on with this fantastic book here a fantastic premise i would say jd morrison hey pete hey how you doing jd what's going on what is up did you change your name recently Good to see you. I recognize your uh, avatar, but I think you might have changed your name, JD. If I'm if I'm mistaken, let me know. I see a lot of avatars. Some I remember, sometimes I don't. It's uh, you know, you know how it goes. You all know how it goes. <clears throat> Augie says I felt it was a rush in the first chapter too. Well, Augie, you finished the whole book, right? <clears throat> oh, sorry, JD. Maybe I was thinking I, I might have been thinking you were somebody else. But thank you for tuning in. Justin Christopher says, remember I mentioned New Morning Dragon for a future book club. Let me write that down too. New Morning Dragon. I've got that written down right under the book of St. Cyprian. Yes. Okay. So, um, anybody else, uh, did anybody else read the book? I know Augie, you've been through the whole book, right? Like you finished the whole thing already. How many, how many, uh, how many people liked the book? We'll do a, a quick poll. We got a, a one for yes. I liked it so far. A two for no. It's boring. <laughs> and how about a zero for, I didn't read it. I'm just hanging out <laughs> to see what this is all about. <laughs> Which is okay. You don't have to read it. I mean, like, honestly, uh, you know, I, I feel like you don't necessarily have to read it to be, enjoy book club either. You know, uh, zero Sonny cat didn't read it. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, like I said, you really don't have to, you know, we're going to talk about it here at length and kind of get into the idea of it. I think that this would make a much better <laughs> com 433. I forgot there was homework. Uh, Augie says three. So, so yeah, it is. It is kind of so, so. Mark Gormley says, let us read from the Necronomicon. Mark, I'll get my copy of the Necronomicon, and we can read from that. I'll just change the name of the stream. Tonight we read from the Necronomicon. Uh, but I've got a Simon Necronomicon, the one from the 70s that has, like, the Assyrian, actual Assyrian magic, like, rituals in it combined with kind of Cthulhu mythos. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, but I do have a copy of the Necronomicon. I think, uh, you know, if you've got an occult library, you definitely need to have a copy of the Necronomicon. I would be remiss. Man Ray of Hope says, I work 50 hours a week, Pete. Let me see. 50 hours a week. Let me see how many I do. Uh, so, I don't know. Um, I do my regular 40, and I wouldn't really consider what I do here work, but I do put in, what, seven, eight hours a week extra doing this uh, on top of uh, my job. So, so 48. So, you got me beat, Man Ray. You got me beat. But like I said, this doesn't really count as work. I'm kind of having a lot of fun here. If you enjoy what you're doing, it doesn't count as work. Caleb Joy Music. That's why we have you, Pete. You're the creepy book reader. Yeah, well, I, I thought the idea of a book club would be fun. 
so we could all get into it. But if, if people are not down with it, then I'm okay with that. Then I don't have to finish this stupid book and we don't have to do book club anymore. So I don't have to be beholden to the nine o'clock time slot that I've got to fill for a half hour with book club stuff. Oh, and it looks like the half hour is up so I can leave now. <laughs> get ready for the 11 o'clock show. Jake Carr's here. Do we discuss the book yet? Uh, Jake, we discussed the book in as much as we were talking about chapter one of the book so far and the introduction of the characters being clunky and awkward. Uh, UFO Paradigm says double episode Sunday, Pete. Uh, well, I mean, we'll be doing one at 11 p.m. Not 11. Uh, yeah, at 11. I forgot what day it was for a minute. Yeah, we'll be doing one at 11 p.m. So uh, roughly uh, an hour and 20 minutes from now, we'll be doing another show. And then who knows, maybe I'll come back in the middle of the night and show up at 3 a.m. for you guys. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe I'll just keep busy streaming, streaming and streaming and streaming. Will you be there? Will you be there to enjoy the streaming with me? What should we talk about at 11 o'clock? Hold on. I'll extend this stream for a little bit while we brainstorm what to talk about at 11 o'clock because we've got about an hour and 20 minutes and uh, I, we got some suggestions uh, yesterday. I got some really good ones yesterday about Tartaria and the mud flood. But I don't know enough about this. <laughs> Jundler, we murdered his dream. We're monsters, says Man Rainbow. If you're not monsters at all, you're great. I love you guys. Peachy says, well, thanks. I learned a new name. Chundler. It's, it's Chil Chilunder, I think, is how you pronounce it. I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> Peachy says, I'll be there. Yeah, listen, everybody, the 11 o'clock show is, is uh, going to be different than this. This is just book club. This is the first time we've done book club. If this is your first experience with the creepy little book, generally you devote a lot more time to aliens, Bigfoots, ghosts, uh, unsolved, unexplained, supernatural kind of topics here um, than we do specific books. This was my first time trying something new to see how it would fly, and it looks like it went over like a lead balloon. And the only thing we've got out of it is this guy's weird name. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Jake Carson, chapter three confused me and I had to read it three times. Chapter one confused me and I had to read it three times, uh, Jake Carr. I think chapter one was really confusing and really clunky and it had too many characters jammed into it at once. But I love the premise of the book. I love the idea. <clears throat> Kayla Joy Music says, I mean, if you read it with you on stream like normal, it may be more digestible for some. As a matter of fact, uh, Caleb Joy Music, when I was reading it out earlier today, because I was going through it again, I decided to uh, to go back. Okay, so I decided to go back and set up my audacity to record my reading of said chapter, because I thought I could put together an audiobook recording of it for Dark Sayings. <clears throat> So maybe that's something I could get to together in the future, you know, put it all together and, and get a audiobook up on another channel on my audiobook channel. Of course. Com 433 said it certainly would help me stay up on my night off from work. Night worker problems. Well, com 433. I hear you. I'm a night worker myself. I do second shift. So uh, that's why my streams are so late at night because I get done work at 1230 and I generally stream at 1 a.m. On the weekends, I can squeeze them in early, which is why we're doing a, you know, nine o'clock now. We'll do our regular eleven o'clock, and then because I'm up late on the weekends, uh, I can usually squeeze one in at three a.m. as well, just for the sake of uh, just you know getting live again and having something to talk about. Augie says Japanese mythological creatures, Japanese mythological creatures. Let's see. That was a suggestion from the uh, the poll, too. So that's not a bad one. Japanese mythological creatures. Betty and Barney. Uh, uh, I think you mean Betty and Barney Hill. Barney Miller. <laughs> UFO Paradigm, you're showing your age. Yeah, Jay Carr points out the chapters are relatively short, but the author seems to just deploy you in the middle of a war zone without any basic training. That is the case. You're just dumped in the middle of the story. You're just, just poured into the middle of it. And, and it's like, seriously, they dump you in a group of, of people 
And they tell you, well, this guy, every time you ask him what he's here for, he gives you a different answer. And this guy, well, you don't got to worry about him. He's dead. And this guy, he's a crazy old priest. And, uh, and he, uh, he's been collecting these occult books so he could burn them all down. And, uh, and he's putting together a crew of men to go find the nine unknown books so we can collect them all together and burn them all in one great conflagration. So they're evil. The kind of which practiced by the witch of Endor may be purged from the face of the earth. Uh, you know. I like I like the idea. I like the idea. I do like the idea. I think it's a good idea. I just don't think it's executed very well. The book is a great premise. I love the idea. And I, I kind of want to read Morning of the Magicians to see where they go with the premise. Because they take the idea that this book is talking about something real. They take the idea that this secret society was founded by a king and emperor in ancient India. And that for over 6,000 years, a group of nine men have preserved these books and the wisdom contained within uh, for the purposes of defending our world from it falling into the wrong hands. So very interesting stuff, uh, needless to say, needless to say. All right. Uh... <laughs> Oh brother, where art thou? Oh brother, where art thou? A great film. Great film. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that movie and the soundtrack. Great soundtrack. Really good soundtrack. Classic film. Very funny. Very funny movie. Uh, based on the Odyssey, loosely, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is is what the movie tells. Is I, I don't even know if the movie might even tell you that. That's loosely based on the Odyssey, but it's a very interesting, very interesting movie. I like it a lot. Anyway, speaking of things we like a lot, <laughs> uh, never seen the illusionist UFO paradigm. Never seen it. It's real hit or miss with me when it comes to movies, but listen, uh, it is nine 45. So I'm going to wrap up here. Cause I'm going to be back at 11 o'clock. So uh, thank you for joining us to talk about chapter one of the nine unknown by Talbot Mundy. If you do appreciate the book club, uh, please give this thumbs up. Well, we got we got pretty good thumbs up here. We're pretty even in the thumbs up regard. So thank you for that. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Range Lunatic and Dash Fat Bastard for your generous super chats and super stickers. They are much appreciated. Never expected, but always appreciated. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, did Tina ever show up here? Is Tina here? I don't think Tina's here, is she? No. Tina's not here. Mecca's here. What's up, Mecca? Well, I want to say thank you to Mecca and Random for being here. Mecca uh, moderator here. Uh, as well as a good friend of the channel. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for everybody for tuning in and for the little mecha raid there. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you all for being here. Please join us again at 11. Yeah, Glynis, next week is chapter two. We're going to rough it through chapter two, and we'll do this for the next 20-something weeks. We we're supposed to do this for a half a year? This is going to take a long time. Maybe we should pick a different book. Maybe the meeting of book club next week is to pick a different book. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> We're supposed to do this for a half a year. Read this slow ass clunky book. I don't know. I think maybe we cut our losses. <laughs> I think maybe we cut our losses and find a new one. Who knows? All right. Listen, uh, like I said, please join us back here at 11 PM Eastern standard time for a brand new show on a crazy new topic. Um, uh, and if you've got topical suggestions, uh, go ahead, leave them in the comment of this video. I'll leave that up uh, for like a half hour, and then we'll uh, we'll be down for anything for book club. Yeah, good stuff, Jeff. That's what I like to hear. Oh, I want book club to succeed, says PG. <laughs> Sorry, the book was disappointing, says Marjorie for it. Marjorie, don't feel bad. You didn't write it. You didn't write it. I don't, we're not going to blame you, Marjorie. Thanks for being here, by the way. You're right. Could have been a better book. I'm sorry I didn't pick a better book, a more exciting book. Something that was more full of thrills and chills from the beginning rather than, uh, you know, what we're getting here, which is a little slow moving. Uh, yeah. Anywho, 
Uh, all right, we'll see you back here at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a brand new fresh topic, whether it be the extraterrestrial or the uh, supernatural or the spiritual or the scriptural or something in between. We have yet to see. So maybe we'll uh, we'll post up another uh, thing in the community tab and you guys can let me know uh, there what you'd like to talk about. I'll leave it open for a half an hour and uh, or 40 minutes and see what you guys say. And then at 1030, I'll close it down and, uh, and we'll go from there. Run a pole Pete says UFO paradigm. That's what I'm thinking of doing. I just need a few options. So, so far, the, my uh, the number one contender we have here is Japanese mythical creatures. So that's going to be going up on the poll, and we'll see what else we'll, we'll talk about there. We'll put a few things up. I've got a. I did want to talk about the religion of the Taino. Uh, man, Ray of Hope, what are you doing? <laughs> that's dirty. I'm not going to repeat that. Anyway, all right. I'm just uh, procrastinating now. We've been at this for 40 minutes. Let me go ahead and do this real quick. Uh, I'm going to just uh, give us a little bit of this. A uh, little bit of this outro here. Uh, okay, this one's pleasant. Okay. Thanks for joining us for the inaugural episode of the book club. Uh, whether or not it was a hit or a miss, that's for you to decide. Uh, I do appreciate your time, your energy, your contributions, these conversations. Thanks for being here. We will be back again at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is just over an hour and 10 minutes from now with a brand new topic to talk about. If you're new here, please subscribe. If you're an old hat at this and you're not following me on social media, my links are all down in the description of this video. Likewise, if you want to support the channel, I got two ways. Patreon for a dollar a month, that's a quarter a week, less than the price of a cup of coffee. And I hope you feel what goes on here every night, including holidays and weekends. It's worth that and you'll sign up. I've also got a spring store with merchandise inspired by the esoteric and the extraterrestrial and everything in between. You'll find masks, uh, tote bags, t-shirts, and coffee mugs, leggings, all kinds of fun stuff there for you to peruse. Please check the store out. I hope you find something you love. Second channel is called Dark Sayings. I do audiobook recordings. You can check that link out in the description of this video. I've also got a P.O. Box 26. That's Pensalka, New Jersey, 08110. If you'd like to send books, snacks from your local area, or any Catholic paraphernalia you need to get your hands off of, go ahead and send it my way. I'm happy to collect that as well. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here tonight. This has been the Creepy Little Book, Book Club, Episode 1, Chapter 1, Talbot Mundy's The Nine Unknown, and we'll see you back here for the Creepy Little Book, live at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with a brand new topic. Thanks for being here, folks. Until then, stay creeped out. <laughs>